Hey, Kim. Um, not only do I appreciate the specific ideas that you uh, shared with us, which I took some notes and I'll get to that in a second. Um, I just, I'm really um, refreshed by the way that you think in general. Because a lot of philosophers will become overly obsessed with their intellectual faculty um, such that they view logic and deduction as the final um, important, most important things um, in abstraction from, you know, a moral sense or an intuitive sense or an emotional or aesthetic sense. Um, they'll, they'll become so obsessed with the intellect that they neglect the importance and the role played by all these other faculties in any apprehension of the truth. You know, as though the truth could be experienced apart from beauty and goodness. I don't think it can, and I think, you know, just the way you think seems to make me think that you would agree. Um, because you're very gentle with your thoughts, you're very careful with your ideas, um, and that shows a degree of wisdom where, you know, you recognize the the way that each of these concepts, truth, beauty, and goodness, are internally related, and what you say about one necessarily affects uh, the others. Um, so, anyways, um, you mentioned, you brought up pantheism, the idea that God is nature, and I'm sentimental to that that argument. Um, the thing is, though, it, we, it depends what we mean by nature. Um, because there is a certain sentiment that science is a mistaken sentiment, I think, that science is equivalent to materialistic, mechanistic reductionism. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, but that's the popular sentiment, so let's say it, it's true. If that, if that is the case, then science is basically... Um, pushed God completely out of, you know, the picture. Um, there's no mystery, there's no spiritual force, there's, there's, you know, even consciousness is somehow outside of nature. Uh, because nature is just a machine, and it, it's all just uh, a determined sequence of events, and yeah, maybe there's some chance thrown in, but there's no uh, novelty, there's no direction, there's no purpose. So, it seems to negate even the potential for a spiritual sense of the cosmos. Um, but as I said, this has in no way been proven by science. This is just a particular metaphysical interpretation uh, of science. Um, I don't think science has proven that our thoughts and emotions are reducible to neural, neural events in the brain. Certainly our thoughts and emotions are related to the brain, to the physical uh, matter organized as our bodies and continually organizing itself as our bodies. Um, but when we understand life or organisms as machines, say, we're kind of, um, well, we're, we're committing what, what one philosopher, A.N. Whitehead, would call the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Uh, we're projecting our conceptualization of life onto the living uh, vitality of an actual organism and assuming that somehow our concept is capable of accounting for the individual life. Um, because the individual life, you know, let's say Darwin's theory is, is supposed to account for the individual life. Um, what Darwin's theory does is, first of all, assume that um, living organization is possible. Um, and from that assumption is able to provide a reason for how the diversity of the biosphere um, is possible because of natural selection and um, random variation. But he has to assume that life exists already. I mean, in the last sentence of The Origin of Species, Darwin writes that um, a creator breathed life into the first form of life. 
he can't account for it in any other way. Um, and it's because he has a Newtonian understanding of matter, or, or a reductionistic, materialistic, mechanistic understanding of matter, that it's just this inert, dead stuff without any subjectivity, without any feelings. Um, it's just blind, purposeless, directionless um, stuff. And so, you know, trying to understand how that stuff could become alive, could gain the ability to feel, was just beyond Darwin's ability, um, so he had to account for it in terms of divine intervention. Um, and, you know, certainly a modern materialist would say we have this new approach now of abiogenesis, where we kind of, we get the, the chemists and the molecular biologists together and, you know, try to figure out how dead stuff could become uh, living cells. But the thing is, you can't begin with dead stuff and get living cells if you recognize that a living cell is sentient. Now maybe as a mechanist or reductionist you don't want to recognize that quality, but then what you're doing is turning your human experience, which is obviously of a sentient nature, of an emotional nature, of a teleological nature, like you have to assume your life has a purpose or you would have killed yourself by now. Um, you're assuming that human consciousness is utterly different than the natural world um, because you're viewing the natural world as a collection of objects rather than a community of subjects. Um, but I think we can still understand nature, even scientifically, without assuming it's just a collection of objects. Um, we can approach nature as a community of subjects, um, thereby, you know, putting the human mind back into the natural world, uh, putting mind into, the, into nature at all. This doesn't necessarily mean that everything becomes mysterious and um, spiritual and that, you know, reality is whatever you think it is. It's not that um, rejecting materialism necessarily leads to mysterianism. Um, it's just that we, we, we're more careful with our ideas and we recognize that our factual, intellectual understanding of reality is inseparable from our moral, emotional, intuitive, artistic um, relation to reality. And that, uh, we can't know it as, as a bare collection of objects um, because as human beings, we are always relating to it as a community of subjects. Um, our own bodies are a community of cells which are living subjects and by communing they produce our individual personalities. They sacrifice themselves for that larger whole. Um, so God is more than a, a concept, I think. Um, more than a human idea, God is the possibility of there being anything at all. Um, I would say. Is that mysterious? Well, there is something, right? And if we're going to try to account for it, we need to assume that there is a purpose for it. Um, and that's where God comes in. Um, is it uncaused? Well, it's an effect of what we know to be the case. In other words, there is order, value, meaning, purpose, experience, uh, beauty, and so forth in our experience of nature. Um, and this experience seems to require that there be a God, that there be an ultimate um, creator um, that is still involved and still itself evolving. That's what pantheism or, you know, panentheism is even better, I think, but I'm not, I'm not going to have time to describe exactly what it is in this video, but uh, Google it. 